Hi, this is Brad Keefley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 3rd, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the positive impact we think Representative Ben Carpenter's proposed sales tax is having on the conversation about an Alaska fiscal solution. Second, we discuss the votes that are taking place this week on the House floor on the proposed budget and how one yesterday served to highlight the hypocrisy of some representatives who claim to be looking out for working Alaska families. And third, we discussed the surprise run-up in oil prices that's happening as a result of OPEC's decision over the weekend to reduce supply and how we believe the legislature should respond to it. And now, let's join Michael. We are joined right now by Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, who comes in for the weekly top three, uh, which is, of course, the big three items that uh, uh, he thinks we should be paying attention to. Uh, and it's kind of topical because yesterday we had a discussion with Ben Carpenter about a full-on realized fiscal plan, which of course included in part his uh, his new plan on or his new bill about a sales tax, and that just happens to be the number one on the Brad Keith Lee discussion list for the weekly top three. The productive discussion triggered by Ben Carpenter's sales tax bill, which Ben was quick to point out is all part of the, in fact, I sent him a text and said, do you want to come on and talk about your sales tax bill? And he said, no. I was like, whoa, I mean, just no. He says, no. He said, um, I want to, but I do have time to talk about the fiscal plan that includes the PFD solution, a spending limit, a CIT reduction, and a sales tax. So you could see which direction he was going here. Brad, take it away. Your thoughts. Well, I think I think Ben has done a tremendous service. In, in floating the sales tax out there. Um, it has started the discussion about the need for revenues, not only uh, in, in the nooks and crannies of government, but I think it's brought it out into the, into the, broader, the broader package. And I think he did a great defense uh, of it yesterday uh, on the show in discussing why he, has, he, he feels the need to have uh, uh, the sales tax revenues as part of the overall the overall fiscal plan. So I think he, I think he's done a great service in, in starting that discussion. It's been interesting to watch the reaction, um, and, but I think the reaction is useful also. Uh, the reaction is from the from the right, from uh, those who don't want taxes of any sort, uh, has been oh no we don't we don't want those taxes we don't want those 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 additional revenues we just need to cut spending. I think Ben did a very good job. I mean that's been the reaction. I think Ben did a very good job yesterday explaining why. That's not realistic. I mean, as he said, if you send 60 people like him down there, you'd get it done. But that's not what Alaskans have done. That's not what Alaskans are going to do. Um, so it's so I, I think that's been a useful discussion to sort of face the reality that cuts only face the reality for some. The cuts only isn't isn't going to be the, the the total solution. It's been really interesting to me to watch um, moderates, so-called moderates. The initial moderate reaction was sales taxes. Oh, they're hugely regressive. Uh, we can't have that. I mean, we need to we need to be doing something else. You can't impose this burden on middle and lower income Alaska families with a regressive sales tax. 
And then to that, that has provided an opening to go, uh, you don't like, a, you think re, uh, sales taxes are regressive? What have you been voting for PFD cuts? And PFD cuts are, are far and away more regressive uh, than sales taxes. And it's been really interesting to sort of watch the dawning realization on some uh, uh, moderates that, oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it has been a useful mechanism to help educate uh, that uh, the PFD cuts are regressive and indeed they're, they're the most regressive tool, uh, fiscal tool out there. And, and I think it has, I, it's not yet, but I think it has the potential to bring some moderates back to a sales tax, complaining all the way that, uh, that sales taxes are regressive, but recognizing that sales taxes are much, 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 much less regressive uh, than, uh, than PFD cuts. So if regressivity is what you're concerned about and, 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 and the impact of fiscal tools on middle and lower income Alaska families, if that's, if that's your focus and that's your concern on 80% of, of Alaska families, if that's your concern, then yeah, sales taxes aren't perfect. But but they are much better than PFD cuts, and I think that dawning realization probably has been well to me has been perhaps the most important contribution that Ben's proposal has made. It's gotten it out there. It's gotten the issue out there in a way that I think has made some people realize that yeah, sales taxes are bad from a regressivity standpoint, but they're better. Than uh, than PFD cuts. I what's, I, I, hope, I, mean, I hope to see that conversation continue. What you I mean, what's led you to believe? Have you seen some comments from some of these people where they're going like, "Oh, well, uh, I I guess uh, PFD cuts are regressive." Have you have you seen that kind of stuff? I, I I've heard I've heard some conversations by some uh, uh, moderate um, so called moderate uh, legislators along those lines, and and I. We'll, we'll talk about the the PFD vote in on the House floor to, uh, in the second segment, but you can see I think some of that showing up in in some of the votes uh, on the on the PFD that they're concerned about the regressive impact of the PFD, um, and I think there has been <clears throat> I've heard some conversation behind behind the scenes, but I've heard some conversation that there's a recognition that sales taxes. Uh, uh, are are less regressive and and aren't all that bad. I mean that the initial knee jerk reaction was oh sales tax is bad can't can never support sales taxes because of regressivity. Uh, PFD cuts are far worse. And then sort of silence silence on the on the on the from the outside but behind the scenes right. I think there's been some discussion about oh yeah wait Aha. yeah if if <laughs> sales taxes are better than than PFD cuts so. I think that's I think that's a plus. Look, I, I'm not I, as I've talked on the show before. I'm not a big fan of, of sales taxes. I think they're regressive. I think they have a. I think I think there's a better way to do this uh, in terms of a flat tax, so that so that all Alaska families have the same stake in the game. And I and I'm concerned that sales taxes don't trigger the top 20 percent in a way that that we need it. I mean, Ben and I to, to some degree, Ben and I are saying the same thing. Yesterday, he talked a lot about. Uh, uh, the need to get the the business lobby group down there pushing back on spending. Well, right. I sort of cut through. I, I sort of cut to the chase and go through the business lobby group and say, who influences, who controls the business lobby group, right? Uh, and and that's the top twenty percent. But to some degree, I mean, it's the same thing. And I and I and I don't. And I'm concerned that sales taxes aren't enough. They're they're they're, they're still skewed enough. They're still regressive enough that they aren't enough to trigger the top twenty percent pushback that uh, that we need. Uh, on spending levels, so I'm not. I'm. I, I mean, I'm. I'm not a huge fan of sales taxes, but I do think it's been very useful to get that re, to to see that initial reaction on regressivity uh, about sales taxes, the explosion about oh my god, sales taxes are so regressive, and then see the dawning awareness of oh my god, they're but they're a hell of a lot better than than uh, than PFD cuts. I think the third thing. That that Ben's that Ben's proposal has done has, is exposed, and, and frankly, this is part of the reason you see the moderate sort of tempering uh, uh, their 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 rhetoric about sales taxes. I think it's exposed the hypocrisy of the progressives. 
who who you know are still exploding about continue to explode about sales taxes and about how regressive they are and about how how horrible they are. Um, but, but nevertheless, again, when when we get to the second segment and talk about the vote on the PFD yesterday on the House floor still support PFD cuts. I mean, right. g- give me a break. You you cannot, you cannot, you know, go off on a tangent complaining about how horrible Ben's proposal is, how horrible sales taxes are, how Republican that is, how, you know, how, how, you know, business oriented that is. You, you can't do that and then still vote for PFD cuts. Ben has given you, Ben has put out there as part of the overall package, but Ben has put out there a proposal that is better for for the one for the for the families you purport to you the progressives purport to defend is better than 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 PFD cuts and you still vote for PFD cuts. I mean, it's just it, I, I think it's exposed the hypocrisy of those who who continue going on down that road. So I think I think it's a great discussion. I think he's done a, I think he's done a great service. It, it, I think it's a I think it's an important uh, service that 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 we get this discussion started. I think it helps move. The, the 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 discussion closer to you know the realization that we need an overall fiscal plan I think it helps move progressives toward or moderates toward the toward the center toward uh, getting toward a, a fiscal plan I think it help helps moves conservatives toward uh, toward the center and realize, realizing that we need an overall fiscal plan I mean it, it's sort of the same thing on the conservative side we got conservatives go oh I'm, I'm, sales taxes are horrible taxes are horrible well yeah but they're better than PFD cuts. I mean, you, let's deal in reality here, right? When you when you when you replace PFD cuts with sales taxes, you've improved the lives of eighty percent of Alaska families, of middle and lower income Alaska families. What? And and yes, I know you want cuts only. Yes, I know there are those out there who are screaming for cuts, but that's not. I mean, as Ben explained yesterday, that's not happening. So for you to continue to go down the road of of, of cuts only, I'm going to oppose all taxes. In leaving us with the only solution being continued PFD cuts, you're as hypocritical, frankly, as the progressives are who continue to say sales tax is bad because they're hor- horribly regressive and then continuing to vote for PFD cuts. What do you think of Ben's um, point here of, uh, of basically trying to tie it all together into a fiscal plan? I mean, I think I, I mean, this nobody has done this that I can recall since I started covering politics. Nobody has talked about this full fiscal plan with all these different points. Obviously, this is the fiscal policy working group, but here's Ben behind the scenes trying to organize and orchestrate this whole thing so that all these bills come together at once. Uh, I mean, it's a monumental undertaking, but I think it's what's needed. I, I think it is too, Michael. And and I, I I took your point in the conversation yesterday about, you know, we're going to prioritize one and push it ahead of the others. That to me, practically, that doesn't work. Because what we want to prioritize, you know, protecting against PFD cuts, constitutionalizing the PFD, and then we'll think about other revenues. That's that's just not going to work with the other side. So I think I think Ben has got it exactly right in pushing all of these things together as part of a package. I mean, that that was one of the takeaways, maybe the key takeaway from the fiscal policy working group. Which that that all of them have to move together politically. All of them have to move together, right? Uh, in, in order to achieve the solution. Yes, we like some more than others. We like the the spending cut side. We like the protect the PFD side, the constitutionalizing the PFD. We like the spending cap side. But we got to realize that, as Ben said, if there were sixty of him down there, it'd be a different result. But there aren't. We got to realize that there's that there's others who aren't going to support this package. In the way it needs to be supported, you got to get two thirds to get the constitutional amendments done. In the way it needs to be supported, there's going to be others that won't do that without without some assurance on the revenue side. I thought it was a very productive conversation yesterday with Ben uh, with Ben Carpenter because uh, it points out. I guess my in highlighting uh, the prioritization of the bills. I mean, I was going back to the fact that he said, you know, we're not going to get it all done at once. I guess my fear is is that they'll look at one component of the plan and they'll look at the least impactful component of a plan and uh, and focus on that and leave everything else to the side. And I guess my point with uh, focusing on the PFD component of it was basically, as I said yesterday, just to take that out of the, you know, it's like we were saying earlier before we came on the air, that, you know, you got to hit rock bottom before you could admit there's a problem. Well, if you take the PFD out of the equation, 
all of a sudden they're faced with a rude awakening and an utter reality that you just can't manufacture. You're not the federal government. You can't just print money. You're going to have to come up with some other solution. Yeah, but but there's a, but we have to understand this. There's a lack of trust on the other side that that will then that that those that once the PFD is constitutionalized, that that those who you know said they'll they'd follow through on revenues would do that, and that that would expose the fact that there wouldn't be uh, that 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 maybe there would be votes against uh, uh, other revenues. It, it's and so the, and so they won't vote for PFD. They won't vote to constitutionalize the PFD until they have some assurance. Uh, on the revenue side, I, that, that's I mean that's the reality they hit in the in the fiscal policy working group, and that's why they talked about it all needing uh, to move together. I you know I it, it's it's tricky. I, I I will grant you getting it all to the same to the same location to the same spot uh, at the same time. But Ben, I mean Ben was very clear saying I vote for a sales tax only if it's part of the overall. Uh, solution. I won't vote. I would. I would not propose. I would not. I would not advocate for. I would not vote for a sales tax alone, uh, if it's not part of the overall solution. So, there, there's 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 mistrust on both sides. I mean, we don't trust. We don't trust. Um, if the if the sales tax went first, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. Or if a tax went first, any tax went first, we wouldn't trust that that's going to be used to offset PFDs. That 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 that. PFD cuts that the PFDs would they would still move for for PFD cuts and so and so you know we have that mistrust and that's why we don't want revenues to go first um, on the other side they don't want PFD cuts to go first because they're concerned that once you know uh, or PFD protection to go first they're concerned that once PFD uh, PFDs are protected that people won't vote for the won't vote for the revenue side so it's it, it's got to move together it's it's complex it, it's tricky. Yes, there may be pieces that come that uh, that that are in jeopardy as it as it moves through that way. But Ben was clear: if it's not an overall package, you don't. He's not going to vote for it. And I am sure that that there's enough there's enough votes out there that feel the same way that they, that they would they'd be able to stop it as well. So um, it's got it's got to move together uh, because of the mutual mistrust that exists on both sides. Gary. Uh, says uh, sales tax is the only fair tax out there, which I think you would disagree with. But he says everyone pays the same for a gallon of milk or a stick of lumber. However, the spending cut is first and foremost solution, which is kind of a synopsis of what I hear from a lot of people. The problem is you can't you can't move. We've been trying cuts. We've been trying cuts first for years. We've been trying to get it. We've been trying to get the right people in the legislature for years. And even when they have the opportunity, they falter. They just it just doesn't come about. There's just not the political will to get it done. I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it other than we can all live in a you know theoretical what if. But unless we can get it done and unless we change because we've been trying for years to do that. And unless we change our plan of attack, nothing is going to change. Continuing to believe in spending cuts only and continuing to hold your breath for spending cuts only is is the surest way to have continued PFD cuts. I mean, I, I wrote a column once that said, you know, that 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 there's some trick being played on Alaska's. The, the top 20% are feeding the, the spending cuts only crowd because that is the way that ensures PFD cuts uh, continue. Spending will continue. I mean, Ben was exactly right about that. Spending will continue. We're not gonna get spending back under control. But if you hold your breath and say spending cuts only, then, then that just uh, that just enables the legislature year after year after year to continue using PFD cuts to fund it because there's there's no other revenues out there to do it. So it's 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 a uh, yeah we could all live in this dream world where our solution was the one that everybody else you know adopted immediately and 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 fell down in praise of and right and, and went forward. But it's not happening. And and, no. And, and I think Ben has become, I mean, Ben went down there as one of the biggest firebrands, but I think he's become realistic and become a leader as a result of that, understanding the process and understanding what it's going to take to get to get a complete right. package done. I mean, if we sent uh, 10 Ben Carpenters and 10 Mike Showers and 10 Kevin McCabe's and 10, you know, and you had 10, 10 and 10 of all these people, if you sent down 30 or five or 40 people that believe this, they could probably get it to happen. The problem is, we don't control 
that. I mean, the folks in the Matsu, the folks in, you know, these conservative areas don't control that. It's the people in their local districts, and that's why we keep getting what we've got. Give us a tease for number two here real quick before we have to go. Well, number two is a, a, a sort of a talk about or a discussion about uh, the bill that's on the House floor, the, the the budget bill that's on the House floor. Some big votes yesterday, already yesterday. They didn't push them to the end this this time. They, they put them at the front. Uh, and we're going to talk about those and, uh, and, and the importance of those and what those mean uh, going forward. Brett Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. It is the weekly top three. We're on to number two, which is talking about this upcoming marathon session that the House is going to have as they go over this budget process. Brad, uh, your thoughts on what's coming up? Well, originally when I wrote this as, a, as a, uh, uh, an issue for uh, to talk about, uh, I was anticipating that the House wouldn't have gotten to the major votes yet, that they would have started into some work on the budget, but wouldn't have gotten to the major votes. What what happened yesterday was they went immediately to the major votes, uh, the vote on education uh, funding and the vote on uh, on the PFD. And, and those two votes have occurred. Now, you know, you can always have additional amendments down the road and, and change the process. And we still have the Senate to go. But we had we had a couple of major votes yesterday. One was to uh, adopt uh, as a, as a one time funding mechanism uh, an additional increase an, an increase in the BSA that was consistent with the the, the bill that passed uh, uh, House Education and is pending before House Finance now to fund the BSA BSA increases on a long term basis. But a one time funding increase in the BSA, I think it's about one hundred and seventy million dollars. Uh, uh, added to the budget that got voted on yesterday, taken care of. Uh, it's out of the way. The budget has been increased by that amount on a one-time basis. They're still going to debate uh, the bill and 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 making that a permanent change. But that got taken care of yesterday. The second thing that got taken care of yesterday was the PFD, um, and there was a there was a proposal on the floor. Andy Story uh, from Juno made the proposal to cut the PFD from. POMV 5050, about $2,700, I think it is, uh, down to $1,300. Bert Stedman's $1,300, essentially to adopt on the on the House side uh, the 2575, POMV 2575 that has been, you know, people have been talking about on the, on the Senate side. And that got defeated surprisingly to me strongly. It got defeated 12 uh, to 28. 12 in favor of, of cutting it to 1,328 against. And the vote, uh, I think, uh, is, is, is very telling. You had uh, people like uh, uh, Genevieve Mina, uh, who is progressive in a lot of areas, new, new representative from uh, Anchorage, progressive right. in a lot of areas, voting uh, against the amendment, voting for the POMV 5050. Uh, uh, Donna Mears, uh, who is the, the, the representative uh, from the swing district that Lance uh, Pruitt used to represent, voting against uh, an additional PFD cut, voting for POMV 5050. Um, you had Will Stapp and uh, uh, Jesse Sumner uh, voting for POMV 5050. And I was a little surprised, frankly, uh, at that, Jason Ruffridge voting for uh, POMV 5050. So there were, there were some surprising. Uh, Andrew Gray was another one. Andrew Gray and Cliff Grow, both of them yeah. voted for it. So I mean, it's surprisingly bipartisan at that point. So I, so I, I think, and and part of that, Michael, as I said in the first segment, I think there's been some recognition that uh, as bad as, uh, as as sales taxes are, PM P, uh, PFD cuts are worse, uh, and it's motivating some people to be defenders of, P, of the PFD, and frankly, I think moving them toward understanding that that there are some revenue options out there that while they may find them unpalatable in the, in the, in the theoretically that from a relative standpoint, relative to PFD cuts, they're better. Uh, Andrew Gray's one of those. And I, and I was encouraged, frankly, to see uh, his vote uh, for POMB 50, 50. Now, as I say, we're a long way from, from completion on this. We have the rest of the, of the house budget. They can always circle back on this. Uh, we have, or the House floor consideration of the budget, they can always circle back on this, uh, and we have uh, uh, we have the Senate to go. But I thought it was a I thought it was an encouraging vote. One other one other thing that just 
irritated me no end. I mean, I think I threw a pin across the across the the room as I was listening to this. Calvin Schrage, um, uh, uh complaining that saying that he just couldn't vote for an unbalanced budget, and and that was the reason he was supporting PFD cuts to get to get uh, to get uh, the PFD and the uh, to to get the budget balanced. Well, this is Schrage who voted for imbalanced budgets before increased spending. Uh, that that has imbalanced the budgets, and it's Shreggy who who you know talks a lot about oh we got to worry about uh, lower income Alaska families we got to worry about you know government taking care of these lower income families middle and lower income Alaska families I'm there Shreggy says I'm there for working Alaska families and then he votes for PFD cuts I mean so I the the hypocrisy of the of the progressives and and the 12 when you look at who the 12 are i mean that's the progressive wing of the alaska legislature the hypocrisy of the pro progressives saying we've got to look out for middle and lower income alaska families and then voting for the thing that hurts the revenue mechanism that hurts alaska middle and lower income alaska families worse the hypocrisy of that is just just you know startling i mean i i i i didn't i don't think i, I don't think i would ever expect them to vote uh, uh, for uh, the POM or for a, uh, for a higher PFD when, you know, they can spend that money instead on government, but the hypocrisy of saying they're doing it to, you know, protect government and government's <clears throat> protection of working in Alaska families and then voting for the revenue mechanism that hurts them the worst is just, just, yeah. just, just shocking. Well, and, and there was some stuff that came out like that, Shreggy. I also like Hannon's, I mean, what she proposed this $1,300 PFD, she goes on and on and about how, you know, we shouldn't be deficit spending. I mean, of course, this has all been happening for the last 12 years, right? All this deficit spending, like all of a sudden it's a bad thing to deficit spend. And then she comes out and says at the end, she says, free rides die hard. And I'm like, free ride? What? You know, again, categorizing our share of the PFD after they got all the monies and all the other stuff and they've drawn all this other stuff. That's a free, this goes right back to that point where I said, they're going to spend the whole PFD and then look you in the eye and go, you're not paying your fair share. That's the free rides argument right there, right? I mean, you know who's, you know, you know, who's getting the free, the, the, the thing that irritates me about that a lot. And she's from Juno. So, you know, you sort of got to understand the context of this, but who's really getting the free ride? The top 20%. We're spending more and more and more and more. And and what what PFD cuts really do is insulate the top twenty percent from having to pay taxes to pay for that increased spending. There, she's what the, what she's proposing is just to shift the free ride. If you if you if you think about PFD, if you want to think about permanent fund earning dollars as free money, shifting the free ride from middle and lower income Alaska families from eighty percent of Alaska families, shifting that free ride, not not taking it away, but shifting it from them. To the top 20 percent that's i mean that's what's going on and 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 she says that with a straight freight face right i mean we're gonna end we ought we need to end the free ride we need to we need to stop well no what you want what you're proposing to do is shift the free ride from middle and lower income alaska families if if permanent fund earnings are free dollars you're proposing to shift the the free ride from middle and lower income alaska families over to the top 20 percent by continuing to insulate them from having to pay for the increased cost of government. It's, yeah. it, it's just, I mean, the, the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of those 12 that voted for continued PFD cuts and the justifications they gave for it is just, is just startling. And, you know, and, but, but that's, I mean, that's 12, that's 12 people in the legislature, 12 of 40. So when somebody says, Oh, we can just do spending cuts only. I mean, look at, you got 12 right there who are, <laughs> who are just never, ever, ever going to do that. Fight against it tooth and nail. All right, well, let's move on to number three, which is what advice, how should the legislature react to the latest oil price surge? Um, and again, my thought would be immediately to say, let's not go on another binge spree, spending spree. Uh, but Brad, what do you say? What? How should they react to the new oil price surge that's coming and expected to increase? Ignore it. I mean, I, I, the, 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 the best advice is... If it happens, okay, uh, it'll put more money in the in the in the CBR. Finally, finally put some money back in the CBR. Uh, finally, start paying back the you know the twelve billion loan that we have out, out of the CBR. Uh, if it doesn't happen, which is much the if it doesn't if it's not sustainable, which is the the more likely case, uh, we won't have spent any time wasted any time worrying about 
you know, what impact it could have. Now, you know, there, there are those commentators out there who are already saying, oh, well, you know, the, the efforts behind the fiscal plan are over. We don't have to, we don't have to, there, there's not going to be an effort to, to get a fiscal plan done because of the oil price increase. Everybody will, you know, sing happy days again and we'll say that we're, and we'll claim that we're off the hook again. That's not going to happen. Oil prices go up, oil prices go down. We've seen that. Um, and, and we need to ignore what may be, in fact, a very temporary blip uh, in oil prices as a result of the Saudi actions. I mean, the, the, the world is not moving into as deep a recession as initially feared last year. Energy prices have softened in part because weather in Europe was more, was more mild. And so they didn't feel the impact of, of cut off of Russian supplies as much as they otherwise might. There's no guarantee that continues. Uh, but, but the world is moving into, into a less solid economic time. The Chinese don't want oil prices to rise. I mean, the Chinese are net importers of, of oil, net users of oil. They don't want, uh, uh, an increase in prices any more than anybody else. And they have the ability to push back on that as well. They're one of the big purchasers of oil, both from Russia and from, and from Saudi. So they have the ability to, I mean, they have a lot of strategic reserves they can call on, uh, they can push back on price. So it's not. We, we shouldn't, there should not be a loss of focus on getting a fiscal plan done simply because we have a, a, a small price blip going on uh, in oil currently, current oil currently. As I say, if it, if it does exist, if it does persist, then the additional revenues will go into the CBR and, and that's good. Uh, uh, it's more likely it doesn't persist and we just need to continue on down the road that we've, that we've already started on recognizing that we have to get our fiscal house in order. Uh, I find it interesting. Again, it, it's always likens that whole thing on the pirates of the Caribbean, where they're running from one side of the ship to the other, uh, you know, Oh, it's a deficit deficit. Oh, surplus surplus. Oh, deficit deficit. That just seems to be the, the constant problem here. For those of you who haven't heard me use that analogy before, remember the Pirates of the Caribbean where they're trying to flip the ship over and they're running from one side of the ship to the other to try and rock the ship and roll it over? I mean, that's what I feel like the legislature does all the time is that's, you know, they, they oh, we're, we're in a deficit. It's crisis, crisis, crisis. And then all of a sudden we're flush with money because oil changes again. And now it's like, oh, how much money? We got more money than we could spend. And then back to the crisis. I mean, it's just, it's the same thing over and over and nobody is paying attention to it. We do, we do this to ourselves. Uh, I, when you look at our fiscal policy, we, we use averages, averages over time to determine uh, the, the percent of market value draw. Uh, it's the five-year average uh, is the, is the basis for the calculation of the percent of market value draw. Uh, we use uh, the same, a different five-year average, but nonetheless a five-year average to determine the PFD, the amount of the PFD, another important uh, characteristic of Alaska fiscal policy. But when it comes to oil, when, but when it comes to oil revenues, which are the most volatile, the, the, the bounce around the most, much more than POMV amounts, much more than uh, uh, PFD, even than PFD amounts, oil revenues are the most volatile. We not only don't use an average, we use a project. We don't. We don't use even the last year's price. We use a projected price uh, to That's determine pie in the sky, right? That's yeah. pie. I mean, I remember again Sean Parnell building a budget predicated on a hundred and fifteen dollars a barrel for for oil when it hadn't been one hundred and fifteen dollars for like two months already, and in fact, it was like down to like eighty five dollars at the time that he actually presented his budget. And you're like, wait, you just predicated this thing on it's pie in the sky. That's what I said. Number four of the tar charter of changes is changing the funding for the budget. We need to look at a five-year rolling average of what we've received as revenues or some kind of mechanism that would smooth this out. So we're not creating budgets that are based on nothing but 100% pure New York Times seller fiction. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I wrote a column a few weeks ago that, that talked about, you know, using a 10-year average and, and smoothing that with sideboards that it couldn't go up any more than a certain amount uh, from year to year or down a certain amount from year to year uh, and, and, and truly developing a, a savings mechanism that, that ran the surpluses in and then used the surpluses in the years that, that oil prices were down. Like we do, uh, essentially like we do with the POMV and with the PFD. In those two mechanisms, 
we've recognized that we that we that predictions are not the way to to determine revenues or not the way to determine you know how to how to how to fund those or how to how to calculate those but with our most volatile revenue source we continue to use this prediction mechanism so if anything if anything in this time of oil prices starting to bounce up, bounce around we ought to at least use an averaging method consistent with the method we use for the POMB uh, and the PFD to determine what what oil prices are we shouldn't just run you know like a dog with a bone run to the latest oil price and say that's going to be that's going to be the target and we can and we can base our budget on that we need to have a much more solid reliable consistent steady uh, revenue source i mean that's what's I, we've talked about this on the program before but that's what's gotten us into this trouble we have years where oil prices roll up we develop a bunch of we develop a bunch of programs around that we say this is, you know, this is this is what we think is a state. How we ought to be uh, be creating a state government, and then oil prices roll roll down. But we've created all these programs, we've created all these expectations, we've created all these constituencies uh, that that are then government funded constituencies that have the money to go down to Juneau to lobby for a continuation of it. We've created all these constituencies to continue to continue spending. If we would have had a a, a, a stable revenue through all of the stable oil revenue through all this by using the an averaging method like we use for POMB and PFD we wouldn't have had those 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 surplus spikes that then created all those programs that then have pushed us into these problems every time i look at this i think of uh, you know I, I for most of my adult life i've been uh, i've been in sales and sales is a variable industry you get paid on a certain commission and some years are great and some years are not and i keep thinking that this is like you know, you had two or three great years, you know, maybe early on in your career, like really high years, and you build a lifestyle around that. And then the market tanks or your industry changes or something goes wrong. And all of a sudden you're living on two thirds of what you were making before, but you've built this whole lifestyle up around it and you just can't cut it. You just can't see yourself. That's exactly what's happened. They built a lifestyle up around you know, the highest three years of their income and they can't figure out why they're having problems for the rest of the time because they're not making nearly the same amount of money. That's exactly what's going on here. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and running to the other side of the ship and saying, Oh, oil's going to save us again. You know, oil prices are up. Uh, we don't have to worry about a fiscal plan. I mean, that's just going to, that's just going to perpetuate it. Right. Cause we're going to, we're going to sustain all these programs, maintain all these programs uh, that, that then when the price drops out of oil, the, the, the bottom drops out of oil that we're then going to have run into the same problems. Ben has us on a track as chair of ways and means. Ben has us on a track and the majority has us on a track to find a, a fix to this, a permanent solution to this. And probably part of that ought to be addressing how we do oil revenues as well. But Ben has us on a track to, to find a fix to this. We need to stay on that track. Uh, and he's, you know, we, he, he's taken the slings of our, and arrows of talking about revenues being part of it because realistic it ha, realistically it has to be part of that. We need to just keep going down that track and 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 find find a permanent fix to this problem, or else or else he was he was right yesterday. The PFD just is just going to continue to wither and wither and wither away until it's gone. Yeah, and then it'll be gone, and then they'll look you in the eye and say, "You freeloaders, you need to pay your fair share." That's what they'll say. Yep. It's uh, it's frightening stuff. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, as always, a pleasure. Thank you for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you being part of it today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.